Easter Sunday. The video says it all. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Christ on the cross, but Sunday morning is coming. The empty tomb is coming. But today we take it a step further. We go to the next part of that message. Because today as we sit here this morning, there's even better news than that. It's Friday morning, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Christ is on the cross, but the tomb's about to be empty. But there's better news than that this morning as we sit here. What is it? Here's the better news. Today is Easter Sunday. It's Easter Sunday, but Christ is coming back. It's Easter Sunday, but the same Jesus Christ that got up and walked out of that tomb is coming back here for you and I. And that is why we celebrate Easter Sunday. We celebrate Easter Sunday because Jesus Christ defeated death. What does that mean in our life? Uh, I think about it all the time. Death has no grip on you and I. Death is no longer in control. There is no such thing as death for your soul any longer. Sure, we die physically and we leave this earth, but your soul lives forever. What does that look like as we walk through our days in 2022? What does that empty tomb really mean for our lives today? That's what we focus on this morning on Easter Sunday. You see, today's Easter Sunday, but without that nasty, dark, depressing, uh, scary Friday, without what looked like a disaster, without Jesus Christ hanging on that cross, there is no Easter Sunday. Brittany said it well, the cross used to be a sign and a symbol of death. It was the most torturous form of execution that the Romans had ever devised, the cross. But then Jesus Christ came and he changed the meaning of the cross. The same thing is true in our lives. We were born into sin, scripture tells us that. Everyone falls short of the glory. At birth we're sinners. But then Jesus Christ shows up. And he changes the meaning of your life just like he changed the meaning of that cross. Today we walk in life because of what he did. Today we walk in life all the time because of what we celebrate here this morning, Easter Sunday. Friday, the sky grew dark. It was nasty, it was cloudy, it was sad, it was depressing. People were angry, upset, absolute chaos on Friday. But all the while... Jesus Christ knew exactly what was going to come to pass. The same is true in your life. We go through seasons where it's cloudy, it's dark, it's depressing. I feel defeated. I feel like there's no way I can possibly get through this. And all the while, just like he was in control as he hung on that cross, all the while, the plans God has for you are still valid and they will still come to pass. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 says, About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about our lives for a second. How many times have you asked that exact same question? Where are you at, God? Why have you failed me here, God? Jesus Christ asked the question, God, why have you forsaken me? The whole time, God says, Listen, I know the plans. I know the plans I have for you. He declares, he declares the same thing about you and I. He knows the plans he has for you and they are to prosper you. They are not to make you sit on the cross that the world has, has devised for you. They, they, the, God's plans for you are not to sit and wallow in the pain and the torture that the world throws your way. His plans for you are everlasting life. His plans in your life is an empty tomb just like it was for Jesus Christ. The veil was torn on Friday. Christ is hanging there on the cross, heaven's weeping, hell's rejoicing. The perfect man, God in flesh, was finally dead. They had finally done what they wanted to do. They had finally defeated this man, this God. They had finally killed him. Satan was rejoicing. What they didn't know was that three days later... What they didn't know was what, that they actually helped to bring Scripture to pass by doing what they did. Jesus endured the cross knowing it was part of the plan and knowing it was just part of getting to that empty tomb and offering you and I everlasting life. He did it for you. The cross, I think about it all the time as they're driving the nails through his wrists and his feet. And he has the courage to, to, to speak out and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He endured those nails for you and me. He did those things so that we could walk in everlasting life. And sometimes I think we struggle to comprehend that. 
Sometimes I think we really struggle to, to figure out what does that mean in my life? How does it change how I'm supposed to live today? Sure, I know when I die, I go to heaven, but there is more to it than that. There's more to being a Christian than that. He didn't just die on the cross and raise from the dead on the third day so that we could selfishly live forever. He did it so that we could focus on his instructions while we're here on this earth. And his instructions are important, more important now than they've ever been. Turn on the news if you think I'm wrong. The world is full of hate and despair. It's our job to issue hope. It's our, hope, it's our job to be the hope dealers in 2022. When Christ died on the cross, he was the silent lamb. But when he rose from the dead, he was the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion, a fierce lion. And he was walking with the resurrection power that he also gives to you and I. Jesus Christ is not in that tomb anymore. He's risen and he's alive. That is why we celebrate Easter Sunday. Today, Easter Sunday, our Savior has humiliated hell. He's outwitted Satan. He's conquered the grave. He's caused sin to bow its knee. He has defeated the strategies of hell against you and your families. He has brought you victory. That empty tomb is about you. The cross was about you. The manger was about you. Moses standing in front of the Red Sea was about you. The entire Bible is about you and I. It's an instruction manual. It's a letter from God to us. We must spend more time in it, understanding that when we read these stories, we are not reading ancient history. We are reading current events. We're reading how God wants you to live today. You're reading how God wants you to live tomorrow, next week, next month. We are reading God's word to us. He's taken your sin and shame and thrown it away. He's announced to the world that you are forgiven and that you're a child of the God that created you. Today's Easter Sunday. The tomb is empty. And if you just see the tomb, you might be scared. You might be a little bit sad. Where's Jesus at? The good news today, he's coming back. That's why we celebrate Easter, because he's coming back for you and I. You see, you can't just go through the Christmas story and stop when Jesus was born, because you know there's more to the story of Christ than that. We, we can't just go to the story of the cross and stop when Jesus gives up his spirit, because we know that there's more to Christ than that. But then when we get to Easter Sunday, we get to the empty tomb and we stop. We celebrate the empty tomb, and we fail to realize there's more to the story, and we are living it. We're living the story right now. Jesus Christ has more for you, and he has more for me, and he has more for everyone who calls on his name. He's conquered the grave, he's conquered sin, and he's coming back because he has more to do. You see, there's another resurrection coming. The question is, are we ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58 says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. How relevant is that instruction right now? Stand firm, believers. Stand firm, Christians. The world tries to convince us all the time to just move ourselves a little bit, a little bit over. And then next year they're going to ask us to move a little bit further again. And before you know it, we have separated ourselves from the instructions that Christ gives us. Scripture says right here, stand firm. Is it going to be comfortable to stand firm? No, it's not. 
Do you think it was comfortable for Christ to have nails driven through his wrist? No, but he knew that was part of the deal. He knew this is what God's asked me to do. This is what my father has asked me to do. The same thing is true for you and I. God is telling you right here, stand firm. Stand firm as a believer. Love people when you don't think it's possible. Love people when the world tells you not to. Be kind to everyone. Reach out to your enemies. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Listen, if you're like me, you love yourself a lot. Do you love your neighbor that much? Honest question. Do you even know your neighbor's name? I have one neighbor right now. I'm going to admit I don't know their name yet. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. That's what it looks like to stand firm. Are you ready for Christ to come back? Were you ready last night for Jesus Christ to come back? Were you ready last month? Ready last year? Will you be ready tomorrow? Next month? Next month? Next year? Here's what we do. We think we know what it means being ready. We do it all the time. We turn on the news and we think, Jesus, when are you just going to come back? Would you just put a stop to all this chaos, God? Would you just come back and, and get this deal over with, Lord? I know you're coming back. Why aren't you here yet? We forget the fact that he dwells in us. We forget the fact that we can do what he says we can do. He's, when we ask him, when are you coming back? He's asking us the same question. When are you going to go and do what I've asked you to do? You have the power to change things through me because I dwell in you. When is the last time you've reached out to someone in need? When is the last time you, you were the first person to apologize? We sit and we become lazy waiting on him. That's not what he means. When we wait on him, we are to go out and do what he's asked us to do. That's what it looks like to wait on the Lord, to do the things he's asked us to do. Today we celebrate Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And, and we celebrate his eternity. And at the same time that we do that, we are celebrating our eternity. We live forever. Your human soul lives forever. One of these days the trumpet will sound. And you will enter into eternity with him. No more death. No more pain. No more dying. No more crying. Revelations chapter 21 verse 4 tells us so. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I saw this example one time. Francis Chan had this big long rope and, and if we were to wrap it around the sanctuary, it would have wrapped all the way around the sanctuary. And he said the rope is your soul. It goes around the room forever. It never stops. And he had this little sliver of black tape at the very end of it. And he said, this is your time on this earth. And we focus all of our energy on this, on this little sliver of black tape on a rope that would stretch for eternity. And he said, but then we're even more silly than that in America. Then we focus on this little sliver on the piece of black tape. We work for 50 years just so we can enjoy seven years of not working. That's what we do. We, we focus on this little sliver we, we spend all of our life saving up enough stuff so that we can just survive seven years on easy street. And we forget the fact that our soul is, is eternal. It never stops. We focus on the wrong things because the world has convinced us to do just that. We've become consumers. Our whole life is built around consuming stuff. God says, I don't need you to be a consumer. I need you to pass out the love, grace, and mercy that is in my book, that is in my word. We have got to focus on, this morning, not just the empty tomb, but the fact that he went back up into heaven. He ascended back into heaven. And scripture tells us, this is mind-blowing, he sits at the right hand of God. You know why he sits there? You know why scripture tells us that he sits right by God? To intercede for you and I. Scripture says, I'm sitting right here, and I intercede on your behalf. How amazing is it, the fact that you have the ear of Jesus Christ, and yet we live, live our lives thinking some things are just impossible. God says, I'm sitting right by God. I've ascended back into heaven. I've defeated death. I have made it to where you don't have to worry about anything anymore, and you consume your lives with worry and anxiety all the time. If we really comprehended the fact that we, we lived forever and our soul was eternal, what would ever upset us in our daily lives here on this earth? Not a whole lot. 
Not a whole lot. But we find ourselves anxious every day. We find ourselves angry all the time. The world's full of anger. The world's full of people that don't understand what Jesus Christ has done for them. And it's our job to let them know. You might feel like today Satan is winning in your life. Some of you may be stuck. Your life might have gotten paused on Friday with Christ hanging on the cross. You, you, can't, you can't seem to get yourself out of addiction. You, you can't seem to get yourself or, or your marriage to Christ. You, you can't seem to find the inner peace that God wants you to live with. You find yourself depressed, hating yourself, angry all the time. You've hit the pause button on Friday with Christ on the cross. You have forgotten that Sunday morning was coming. You have forgotten that there's no such thing as victory without the threat of defeat. Listen, as a Cubs fan, I know that well. There's no su some, some years there's just no such thing as victory. Yep, she says, I know, I know. <laughs> you've, you've convinced yourself, you've allowed the world to convince you that Christ is still dead. That your life is hopeless, that there's no hope for you, you loser. There's no hope for you. You're never going to beat that addiction. You're never going to find that job. You're always going to have a terrible marriage. You're a loser. They thought the same thing about Christ. But remember, as Jesus hung on that cross, he knew God's plan. He knew God's plan. And he knew that no matter what happened, God's plan would come to pass. The same is true for you as you sit here this morning. I don't care if you, if you are stuck in addiction. I do care, but I don't care. Because I know God's plans for you. That's not the end of your story. That's not the, the needle's not the end of your story. The bottle's not the end of your story. That divorce is not the end of your story. They thought Christ was dead too. And Satan might think he's got your soul exactly where he wants it. But Sunday morning is coming in your life. And Jesus Christ eventually is coming back for the soul that is you. He loves you that much that he's coming back for it. The story, your story, is not written yet. It's not finished because of what he did in the cross, on the cross and in the tomb. You know, there's a true story from England we're going sh to read today. It's a story about the news of the victory at the Battle of Waterloo. Mark's going to love this. He's a history buff. It's a story about how the news of victory at the Battle of Waterloo arrived in England, and it's relevant today. There were no telegrams or telephones back in these days. Nobody could send a text or put it on Facebook or YouTube. There was nobody standing in front of the battleship giving duck lips. None of that was around. Some of you give duck lips. I heard a laugh. Somebody knows duck lipping. <laughs> But everybody knew that Wellington was facing Napoleon in the great battle on the 18th of June, 1815. And that the future of England was in great uncertainty. A sailing ship signaled with coded flags the news to the signalman on top of the Winchester Cathedral. He signaled to another man somewhere on a hill. And this way, the news of the battle was passed on by signals from one place to another, all the way to London, and across the whole land. When the ship came in, the signalman on board signaled the first word, Wellington. The next word was defeated. And then the fog came, and the ship could not be seen any longer. Wellington defeated, went across England. There was great gloom all over the countryside. Wellington defeated, and then the fog came. And that was the end of the message. People thought they would go back into sl slavery and captivity. People hid in terror at the news. All hope was lost. After two or three hours, the fog lifted and the signal came again. You see, there was more to the message than what they saw before the fog rolled in. There was more to the message. So when the fog lifted, they were able to finish the signal came in one last time. Wellington defeated the enemy was the message. Wellington defeated the enemy was the message. There were some people still hiding in fear when the real message came. Some people lived days, weeks, some, some of them maybe months and years thinking that Wellington had been defeated, that they had lost, that they had to live the rest of their life in bondage. When the real message was, Wellington defeated the enemy. 
All they had to do was be patient and wait for the fog to lift and they would see the victory that was handed to them. The same thing is true for you and I as believers. We live our lives and, we, and the first words come in from Satan, you're defeated, you're still in that bottle. And we think that's the end of the story. Patience. Get yourself in the word because there's more to his message for you. You are not defeated. You never were. The only reason we, we are defeated ever is because we convince ourselves that we are. You are not defeated. You're not more important or powerful than what Christ did for you. He has already won the victory. You can't give it back unless you voluntarily give it back. It's yours. And it's yours forever, church. On Friday, when they put the body of Christ into that tomb, the message came out just like they came out from that ship. Christ defeated. Jesus Christ defeated. On the cross, he's dead, they said. Finally, they mocked him. They couldn't stand him because he threatened their authority. He threatened them. He threatened their way of life. And for many of us, that's where we sit right now today. I'm defeated. I'm depressed. I've lost. I'm just trying to survive my remaining years on this earth. I'm just going through the motions. We wake up on Monday. We drink that cup of coffee. Some of us a whole pot. We go to work. We spend eight or ten hours at our jobs. We go home. We spend an hour or two with the kids. We go to bed. We wake up. We do it all again. We just talked about it at a men's group. We're going through the motions. Jesus Christ doesn't want us to just go through the motions. He didn't create you on this earth to be mediocre. He doesn't need mediocre Christians because to be a Christian means you're anything but mediocre. You have his power in you. Jesus Christ says in scripture, listen, not only can you do the things I've done here on this earth, you can do even greater things than these. Think for a moment about the things he did. Think about what God did on this earth and he says you can do even greater things. He told Moses to stick out his staff and he parted the Red Sea. And he says, you can do even greater. He went up to a tomb with Lazarus in it, dead for four days, and said, get out of the tomb. And he says, you can do even greater things than that. He put spit in the mud and put him on a blind man's eyes and the man could see. And he says, you can do even greater things than that. Listen, if you don't believe those promises, that's on you, not God. He tells you you can do them right here. The Bible is full of promises for you. That is why we celebrate Easter Sunday, because the story doesn't end at the cross. It ends with you and I doing the things he has sent us here to do. It ends with you and I loving people unconditionally, loving people through their sin, loving our neighbors like we love ourselves. It ends with you and I spreading the peace, love, hope, grace, and mercy that he tells us to. All right, that part was not even in the sermon. So now we're going to start the sermon. <laughs> Now you see why the sermons are four hours long here. That was the introduction. Brittany's got four more songs, and then we'll start the sermon. <laughs> in your bulletin today, we did something a little different on Easter Sunday. Your bulletin has an acrostic in it. I had to Google that word five times to make sure I pronounced it right. Acrostic in it. We're going to go through that acrostic. If you've got a pen or pencil, feel free to fill it out. The E in Easter stands for Emmanuel, God with us. The message of Easter is that Jesus Christ came to this earth in human flesh. God with us. God is with you right now. God will be with you tomorrow. God was with you last week. He was with you last month. He'll be with you next year. If you don't recognize the fact that God is with you, it's not because he's not with you. It's because you are not acknowledging him. He's there with you right now and always will be. He was clothed in human skin. How do we know this is true? It's how we know everything's true. It's in scripture. John chapter 14 verses 8 through 10. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Philip said, tells Jesus Christ, show us the father. Sometimes I read scripture, I'm like, seriously, Philip, are you serious? Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been, you, been amongst you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. 
Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing the work. We ask the same question Philip asks all the time. We read scripture, we know the truth. And all the time we ask ourselves, ask ourselves, God, where are you? Just show me one sign, God. Just show me one sign. Listen, if you wake up and don't see signs of God, you haven't opened your eyes. Just wake up, open your eyes, and there are signs that God is with you all over the place. The E is for Emmanuel, God with us. He's with you today. The A stands for atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of your sin. The, the blood of Jesus Christ covers you today. Your past is forgiven. There's people in this room right now that have not come to grips with that fact. That will live the rest of today depressed again because of their past. Listen, your past is forgiven. Jesus Christ has already paid the price for that. You know, we had a pastor that preached a sermon one time about our tombstones in our graveyard. We all have them. We all have things in our past we're not proud of. Tombstones marking our sins here and there. Those have been forgiven. You don't have to live in that graveyard any longer. You can walk out of there. You don't have to turn around and look back at your tombstones that the world has placed in your life. Why do we constantly go back to those places? Listen, Jesus Christ on the cross said it's finished. It is finished. You have no power and no authority to tell him it's not. He's already paid the price for you. Your sins are forgiven. I don't care what the world tells you. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross, you can live in the saving grace that came from the blood that he shed for you. You're covered in it. The S stands for security. You are secure in your salvation. Some of you in here think you can lose it. Listen, how can you lose something that's freely given to you? You can't. It's given to you. It's yours. It's a free gift from him. You are secure in your salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 35 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Listen, no one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? You know what God's telling you there? Nothing can separate you from my love. It's there. The gift of salvation is yours. And it's yours forever once you accept him as your savior. Nothing the world throws your way will ever separate you from the love that Christ has for you. Nothing. But we allow the world to convince us all the time that that's not the case. This is the big one. Listen, I'm just as guilty as all y'all. This is the one. This is the big one. I'm really worried about this when we forget about the five million times God's come through, through for us in impossible situations. And we always think the one that we're looking at right now is the big one. This is the one God can't handle. Listen, next time you think God can't handle your trouble, your trouble remember, he spoke everything into existence. He just spoke and it was. God says, let there be light, there's light. God spoke everything you see into existence. There is nothing too far for him. There's nothing too hard for him. You cannot out God's grace, mercy, and love. The T stands for truth. We, we preach about this every week. God's truth is in his word. His word is his truth. His word is the truth. If you don't read scripture every day, you're cheating yourself. You're not cheating me. You're not cheating, cheating the elders. You're not cheating the church. You're cheating yourself, your spouse, your kids, and your family if you're not reading scripture every day. Because even though we all fall short of his glory, we must understand what he tells us. Because what he tells us is truth. And it's not truth just sometimes. It's truth all of the time. The reason that we're so easily persuaded one way or another by the world is because we don't fully understand or comprehend what his truth is. And most of the time, the only thing stopping us from understanding the truth is actually just reading it. 
We must be in the word all the time, knowing that when God speaks, it happens. Listen to Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? The promises God makes you in scripture will happen in your life. I don't care if today's Friday and things look gloomy. Sunday morning is coming in your life because he tells you so. You win because he wins. He is in you because he tells you he's in you. He has plans for you because he says so. His plans for you are to prosper you because he says so. Everyone that comes to him will be saved because he says so. You can do what he tells you you can do. The question is, do you know what he tells you you can do? It's as simple as that. It is as simple as that. The next E stands for eternal life. Your soul will live forever. Death no longer has a grip on you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Your soul never dies. Never. You know, I hear it all the time. You only live once. That's incorrect. You only die one time. You live forever. You only die one time. Start telling your coworker that and see how weird they look at you. You only die once. Yodo. <laughs> Start telling everybody Yodo. Go ahead and buy the car, brother. Yodo. Yeah, get that handbag, sister. Yodo. <laughs> they might call the cops, but it'll be funny. <laughs> Yodo. Wow. Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> The last letter in the acrostic, the R, stands for resurrection. Resurrection. Bringing something back to life. We've been talking about revival a lot the past few weeks here at Family Worship Center. Revival. Taking something that's dead and bringing it back to life. Giving something a new meaning through death. It's what Jesus Christ did for you and I. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. I'm going to close with this. There's a really popular song called Ain't No Grave. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. I would sing it, but all of you would leave immediately. <laughs> yeah, you'd be yelling Yodo at me. Keep singing, brother Yodo. <laughs> you don't want me to sing, trust me. There ain't no grave that's going to hold your soul down. It's not possible because it never dies. There ain't no grave that's going to hold your body down. I don't care what it looks like for you today. Is it alcohol? Listen, there ain't no grave going to hold you down. Is it drugs? There ain't no grave going to hold you down. There's some teachers in the room. I know ain't is not a word. Is it lust? There ain't no grave going to hold your body down. Is it shame? There ain't no grave going to hold your body down. Self-hate? No grave going to hold you down. Regret? No grave going to hold you down. Today, right now, you have the power to stand up just like Lazarus did and walk out of the tomb that you have trapped yourself in. We trap ourselves in our own tombs. The stone has been rolled away. If you're still in there, the only reason you're still in there is because you have not stood up and walked out of there. Christ has already done all he needs to do for you to get up and walk out. And remember the story of Lazarus. Even some of his own family thought he was hopeless. His own sister said, listen, God, it's going to smell really bad in there. Jesus said, that doesn't matter to me. I'm going to walk in there and command him to stand up. And the second I speak, he's going to stand up and walk out of there. And then I'm going to tell the world to take his grave clothes off of him. He's going to do the same thing in your life. He's already spoken the words. Can you imagine for a moment how ridiculous it would be if we read that story and God told Lazarus, get up and walk out. And Lazarus poked his head up and said, just a few more days on this deathbed. We would think he was ridiculous, but that's how we live. He tells you all the time, get up and walk out. We stay there. 
We don't have to stay there anymore. It's Easter Sunday. His tomb is empty, and so is yours. Stop walking back into that tomb. We do it because we're comfortable doing it. You know, we have a shop dog at the, at the office. When we first got her, she was crazy. I remember the first day we got her, Dad called me and said, we're going to have to take the dog back because she chewed up the welder. <laughs> she really did. She ate a welder. She had the whole shop destroyed. <laughs> we got this little cage. We put her in a dog kennel for four or five days in a row. That kennel still sits right there in that shop. You know, every single night that dog gets into that kennel, nobody makes her get in there. She walks into this own, her own cage. The door's open. She does not have to sleep in that little cubicle anymore, but she's been trained to go in there. So that's where she goes. That is exactly what the world has done to us. The grave is open, but we're trained to walk right back into it every single night. The world has taught us to do it, and we're comfortable there. That's how ridiculous it is. We are comfortable in that tomb. We come to church on Easter Sunday. We feel great. Monday morning, we walk right back into the tomb because it's where we know we need to be. That's what the world tells us, and that's exactly where we go. Our shop dog has access to the entire shop, but she confines herself to this little box every night. God has given you access to the entire kingdom. He tells us you are a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Think about what that means for just a moment. You are a co-heir with the Savior of the world. You are a co-heir with God in human flesh. You have access to everything in Scripture. You can do greater things than he says you can do, but yet we crawl back into this little box every day. It's ridiculous. It would have been ridiculous if Lazarus had done it, and it's ridiculous that we do it. You do not have to live there. That's what Easter Sunday is about. Easter Sunday is about the empty tomb of, tomb of Jesus Christ, but it is also about your empty tomb. Can you imagine if Jesus came back and said, I'm going to go back into that tomb and roll the stone back across the door? We do it all the time, church. Friday night had to have been absolute chaos. Depressing. Jesus Christ up on the cross, all hope was lost. That's where a lot of us are at in our own lives. Absolute chaos. I have people call me all the time, Pastor Brad. They tell us stories that are just mind-blowing. The chaos that people deal with in their lives. You do not have to live there. That's not what God intended for you. That's not God's plans for you. Satan was cheering because they thought they had finally defeated Christ. Little did he know that through Christ, the impossible was possible. When the world looked up at Jesus, they thought, this is, this is terrible. They forgot the fact that all things are possible through Christ. And sometimes we forget that the same promise is made to us in Scripture. Jesus tell us, tells us, through me, all things are possible. Yeah, to a man, to a woman, to the world, this might look impossible, but nothing is impossible with Christ. I don't care if you've been an alcoholic for 20 years. You have the power and the ability to stop. Nothing is impossible. I don't care if your marriage has been a disaster for 30 years. Nothing is impossible with Christ. I don't care if you've been depressed for five years. Nothing is impossible with Christ. Jesus Christ came to this earth for you. He died on the cross for you. He rose again for you. And now he sits at the right hand of God for you. Do you think for a second that he did that just so we could be mediocre human beings? No, he did it because his plans for you are enormous and he needs you to walk in those plans. We sit on our couch all the time and we're waiting for Jesus Christ to come back and he's telling you the whole time, go, go into all the world, do stuff, love people. 
don't wait on me. I'm coming. Stop waiting on me. Go and do it. Why? Because he said so. You know that answer drives my kids nuts, by the way. Why, Dad? Because I said. We ask God all the time, why? Because he said. Because he's the creator. We're the creation. He is the creator. Go and do as he tells us to go and do. Start it on Easter Sunday. Start a new, a new family tradition in your family that you're going to start walking in the word. Make Easter Sunday 2022 the day that the chains in your family are broken and you are the one responsible for breaking them because Christ did it through you. Life doesn't have to be the way it's always been, church. As a matter of fact, it's not supposed to be. The world needs the saving grace of the gospel, and we're the ones that have it to pass out to them. People in this town right now don't understand that the tomb's empty. People in this town right now don't understand that I don't have to be stuck in this or that because that's how they've always lived. They need us to go and share the good news with them. That is what Easter Sunday's all about, church. Sharing the good news. There's lots of people in your life that saw the first two words of the message just like they saw on that ship, and then the fog rolled in, and they've been living their whole lives thinking they've been defeated. Victory is theirs just as much as it is ours. That neighbor that you can't stand, victory is theirs too. That family member that you haven't talked to in years, victory is theirs. We love them because he loved us, church. The world needs the news of scripture. Let's start passing it out, and let's start passing it out today. The tomb is empty, so is yours. God, we thank you so much for this word, Lord. We thank you for Easter Sunday. God, we thank you for the fact that, that the tomb is empty. We thank you for the fact, Lord, that we don't have to start, we don't have to keep walking back into the tombs that trap us all the time. God, we thank you for the fact that Christ died on the cross for us, that he shed his blood for us, that he rose from the dead, Lord, that he ascended back into heaven, and we thank you, Jesus, that you're sitting right at the right hand of God to intercede for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have plans for us, individual, specific plans for all of us, and that those plans are to prosper us and give us a hope and a future. God, we walk in that hope today. We walk into the future today knowing that you are guiding the way, Lord, and knowing that with you, nothing is impossible for us. God, if there's anybody in this room that has not accepted the saving grace of Jesus Christ, make today the day. God, give them the courage to walk up and receive the salvation that you have freely given them. Allow them to receive the eternal life, Lord, that you have designed us to live in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.